On this week's edition of New York Now, New York tries to shut down the NRA and lawmakers hold the first hearing on the state's handling of nursing homes. We want to make sure that we save lives and by changing policy, we might be able to do that. John Campbell from the USA Today Network joins me in studio to discuss. Senate Corrections Chair Luis Sepulveda has analysis on the state's handling of prisons during COVID-19 and legal protections in health care. Schools are likely back in session this fall, and that includes SUNY campuses. Fred Cole from United University Professions has details. And Eddie Tavares from Forward.us breaks down the immigrant experience during COVID-19. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a pass a law prohibiting it, and we will take them to court challenging it. stand. Uh, for New York and sending a message to the nation. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. New York has started a new war with the National Rifle Association. Attorney General Tish James filed a lawsuit this week to dissolve the gun lobby group. She said at a press conference in Manhattan that top officials at the NRA had used the group's funds for their own self-interest. They use millions upon millions of dollars from the NRA for personal use including for lavish trips for themselves and their families, private jets, expensive meals, and other private travel. With me in studio to talk about that and much, much more is John Campbell from the USA Today Network. John, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Dan. This is a huge lawsuit, I think. I, I know the state has had legal problems, problems, confrontations with the NRA before, but going as far as saying that you want to dissolve the NRA seems like an extreme step, even for Tish James. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all because way back in the 1870s, oh. the NRA incorporated in New York. So they are, they're subject to New York's charitable laws and they're subject to the jurisdiction of the Attorney General, Letitia James. And we actually saw this two years ago with the Trump Foundation. We saw the then Attorney General Barbara Underwood bring a lawsuit against the Trump's, Trump Foundation seeking disillusion. They ultimately settled and did dissolve. So there is precedent, but the NRA is a different animal. The NRA is one of the most politically powerful organizations in the country, has been around for more than 100 years, and, and has really built up power and uh, you know become a, a bastion of power in the United States. So this is this is on another level. That said, we have seen lots of financial issues with the the NRA coming into this. There was a power struggle, a very public power struggle last year. Oh yeah, uh, between the NRA president and Wayne Lapierre, the the CEO, who was one of the people who was sued today, by, or uh, Thursday, by the Attorney General. Yeah. So I mean, what we had happen Thursday was the Tish James, the AG, sued the NRA. And then the NRA countersued Tish James. Yeah. And so we have two of these lawsuits, and it just seems like a lot of, a lot of hullabaloo. Well, and it also <laughs> it seems very clear that this isn't going to be like the Trump Foundation situation two years ago. Yeah. The NRA is is gearing up for a fight. You know, Letitia James's lawsuit. You know, it it accused the NRA of a wide array of wrongdoing and. Four members, four leaders of the NRA, led by Wayne Lapierre, the, the CEO since the, the 90s, uh, you know, it, they accused him, uh, the AG accused him of, of essentially funding his lavish lifestyle with NRA funds, going to the Bahamas eight times in three years with his mm. family on private charters, uh, having an NRA vendor pay for an African safari. And then there's, you know, various levels of fraud alleged here, too, that, you know, New York has very specific rules for uh, what needs to be reported, who needs to sign off on it. And, and the attorney general accused NRA of, of signing off on, on, you know, some fraudulent uh, documents, essentially. The NRA is countersuing, essentially, and saying, well, you know, Letitia James campaigned on the NRA and said she needs, she's going to take it to the NRA and she's going to take on the NRA. And they're using those statements from her campaign to kind of allege that the, the attorney general's office is infringing on the NRA's First Amendment rights. You know, this is so interesting to me because as a reporter in a previous job to this one, I covered the NRA's lawsuit against the state, which was filed a few years ago. The NRA alleged at that time basically the same First Amendment claims. And I will say three two or three years later, that lawsuit's still ongoing. So I, I'd hate to be a pessimist for the attorney general, but I just don't know if this is going to go anywhere. And it seems suspect, I'm sure, that some will say that this uh, lawsuit is filed in August in an election year against a group 
that the president fervently supports. Well, I, it's it's something that has been on the attorney general's agenda for some time. Oh, the for attorney, sure. The NRA does claim that, you know, this is, look, this is a presidential year, and of course you could have set your watch to it, that they would have, uh, the attorney general's office is going to come out. But this very clearly seems like it is going to be a lengthy legal battle. It's not something that's going to be cleared up uh, in the coming months even. I mean, this could be something that takes years if the NRA fights it. And by all intention, or by all, you know, it, of all appearances on Thursday, it seems that the NRA is going to fight it. Switching gears, we have the first hearing on the state's handling of nursing homes during COVID-19 this week. Uh, I don't know how much of it you watched, but I basically watched uh, the health commissioner's testimony, Howard Zucker, and this was over Zoom, so it was very awkward. He was at a table, and they were all at their computers. Hearings in the age of COVID-19. I know. So they were peppering him with questions about uh, various things that the state did in terms of nursing homes, and I got to tell you, just watching him, I have seen very few people with such an ability not to answer the question presented to them. And, and that's something that really angered lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the, the one question that he got over and over in various different forms is, why isn't the state reporting how many nursing home residents die in a hospital setting? Right. The state did do that at first in April and early May, but they changed their, their reporting in May and stopped reporting people who die, who are nursing home patients who die in the hospital. They still do report nursing home patients who die in the nursing home, but that's an incomplete picture, any way, any way you put it. And uh, Howard Zucker, the health commissioner, he said, well, I don't want to give inaccurate information. We're trying to make sure that these people aren't double counted. We'll get back to you. That wasn't good enough for a lot of, of lawmakers on both sides of the aisle who have uh, really made noise after. There's another hearing coming up. We don't know if the health department's going to participate in that one, but Perhaps we'll get some answers then. But it'll be so interesting if they do, because as you'll remember from Monday, I think the hearing was, he testified for two hours, and then Gustavo Rivera, who we had on the show last week, he's the health chair in the Senate, said, he's got to go. He's got other yeah. things to do. Well, oh. then the next day, or, or maybe two days later, the health commissioner did testify again to the Senate Education Committee. During the roundtable. Very specific to school reopening. I mean, right. The guy has a lot on his plate. There's no way that you, you can't say that. But, uh, you know, it'll be very interesting to see if he testifies again. All right. Something that we are going to watch for sure, especially coming up. I think that that's a second hearing, and they're going to have a hearing on hospitals as well. So something we're all watching. John Campbell from the USA Today Network, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So while this week's topic was nursing homes for the legislature, last week they held a hearing on higher education during the pandemic. Students are heading back to campus this month with new safety precautions in place, and that includes SUNY colleges and universities. But SUNY workers say the state could be doing more to safely reopen schools. I spoke with Fred Cole from United University Professions, the union representing SUNY workers. Fred, thanks so much for being here on New York Now this week. It's great to be here. Thank you. Anytime. So let's get right to it. You represent workers at SUNY campuses and universities around the state. Can these schools safely reopen in the fall? And I think they're going to come back to campus this month. Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, we know that there are students that are going to be arriving at some of the campuses within the next week or two. Mm -hmm. um, we also, of course, face the reality that we have students who have already returned to the medical schools at Upstate, out at UB, Stony Brook, and Downstate. Uh, but yes, it's, it is a situation where obviously we're very concerned about the health and safety of our members, of the students, and the communities in which we live. And that's why we have staked out the positions we have regarding what we believe is necessary for SUNY to have a safe reopening and to maintain the education uh, process throughout the entire fall semester. So before we get to that, can we just go over, do we know what precautions SUNY is taking already proactively to reduce the spread or prevent any kind of contamination on campus? Well. Basically, so far, what has happened is that SUNY campuses have had to submit their proposed plans for reopening to central administration. Uh, SUNY has then approved those plans, and now comes the implementation of those plans. What is occurring and, and what we're seeing is that there is a variety across campuses. Some campuses, like at the University of Albany, uh, Stony Brook University, now the college at Geneseo, they will be requiring testing of students before students arrive on campus, which is what we believe is an absolute necessity. Other campuses, however, have not taken that step. 
And that's why we are pressing the governor particularly to basically carry through on the, the, the message he's been delivering about how necessary testing is and to go ahead and require it for all institutions of higher education. Private institutions are testing across New York State for the most part. It's the public institutions, obviously, that we represent where we are concerned. And part of that concern comes from the fact that we do represent members who work in public hospitals. They have seen the ravages of COVID, you know, face to face for months now. And we don't want those hospitals overrun again with another statewide outbreak. And so we believe very strongly that testing is an absolute necessity. So aside from testing, which is very important across all facets of this, tell me what else you want to see on these campuses uh, for both faculty and students to keep people safe. Well, we, we believe that what's necessary then is to follow up with some sort of surveillance testing. And, and we and, and SUNY have had conversations about how that could be done. There are a variety of different ways, some really innovative ones. And uh, I believe that there will be more direction to campuses on that because I think everyone is in agreement that there has to be a surveillance of what is happening on a day in and day out basis on campuses. The other thing that I believe is very important, and again, SUNY has issued some directives to campuses on that, is the requirement to wear masks. Now, where we would like to see the state go with that and SUNY is that masks re be required at all times while indoors. Because now there is the caveat that as long as you are farther than six feet apart, you don't have to wear a mask. That will present real problems in our classrooms, in our, our residence halls, in laboratories, everywhere. So we believe it's necessary to restrict uh, the wearing of masks or, or let's say expand the wearing of masks much more. And then of course there's contact tracing. That's a necessity. We see the entire state putting an investment in that. That's important. Lastly, we have negotiated a telecommuting agreement with the state of New York, as have all the statewide public sector unions. And that has enabled our members to work from home to lower the density of the population on campuses. We're getting the work done very effectively and also serving the public health interest. And we would like to see that agreement extended. It's due to expire on October 2nd. That's in the middle of the fall semester. Let's extend that out to the end of the year. We hope the governor does that. And then we can continue to utilize the technology we have to serve our students and our state while at the same time limiting the spread of the coronavirus. All right, well, we will be watching over the next couple of months. Fred Cole from United University Professions, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Back in Albany, Governor Cuomo signed a bill this week to loosen a set of legal protections given to hospitals and nursing homes in April. The idea behind those protections was to give healthcare providers some legal flexibility at a time when nobody knew what to expect from the coronavirus. Senator Luis Sepulveda sponsored the bill to relax those legal protections. He's also the chair of the Corrections Committee and says he wants more transparency in the state's prison system. We spoke this week. Senator Sepulveda, thanks so much for being on New York Now this week. Thank you so much for inviting me. Happy to be here. So we had our first hearing this week on the state's handling of nursing homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, there's going to be one next week as well. But I wanted to talk to you about a bill that you sponsored and just to backtrack a little bit. In March or April, the legislature passed legislation that granted these blanket legal protections to nursing homes and healthcare facilities. And you had a bill that passed in July that rolled them back and really narrowed them down and limited them. Tell me if I'm somebody going to a hospital or one of these healthcare facilities, how that's going to change my experience there. Well, that means that now, now that we have uh, more information, more available science uh, about the way the COVID-19 disease is spread uh, and the standards of care that the hospitals can now use, they understand now how uh, the, the virus functions a little better than it did back when we passed the budget and we gave that, that unqualified immunity to the nursing homes, let's say, in the hospitals. Now that we have that information, the nursing homes, uh, the hospitals, they are better able now to prepare incoming patients, incoming seniors for their nursing homes and take the correct measures that will protect them from uh, being infected inadvertently uh, uh, with the coronavirus. So since we have all that information, uh, we felt that giving a, a, a complete unqualified immunity to these health facilities was no longer warranted. Uh, 
uh, now that they are in a position to be able to understand the virus and take precautionary measures, that there's no reason why they should be forgiven if they violate the standard of care or, or outright negligent in their treatment of patients or seniors at nursing homes. I know it's hard to look back a few months ago when you were first passing that legislation as, as the legislature and the governor as part of the state budget, but do you think knowing what you know now that it was a mistake going in or is that impossible to say? Well, it's impossible to say. I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. The opposing view of those who didn't want to give uh, any level of immunity um, and the views of the hospitals were diametrically opposed. The, the hospitals were concerned about if they suddenly get swarmed with lawsuits, then there may no longer be hospitals in those locations. They'd have to close down or they'd have to file for bankruptcy. Um, so there was a serious concern that during the crisis of that, we didn't want to put hospitals in that situation or even nursing homes in that situation. So we didn't know what we were facing. And, and to some degree, that justified the drastic measures that we took. So shifting to a different but related topic, you had another bill that passed that allows the Correctional Association, which is a prison watchdog group, gives them new powers. They can now visit state prisons unannounced. They can interview people that are incarcerated and correctional officers. Tell me the intent of that bill and what kind of transparency you're hoping to provide to the state's prison system through that. The, you know, as the chair of the Corrections Committee, I've been extremely um, frustrated uh, for the last couple of years about the, the lack of, uh, of information that we receive uh, from docs, uh, certainly in real time. You know, we try to have a working relationship with Commissioner Anucci, and, I, you know, I believe he does the best that he can. Uh, we try to get information about correctional facilities uh, from the governor's office, and, you know, there's always a lapse in time or, you know, the element of surprise no longer exists if we want to go to a corrections facility. I've always believed that the sunlight is the best disinfectant. If you want to see how the... Uh, how the inmate or the persons that are incarcerated are treated. If you want to see whether the, facility, the facilities are um, dealing with people as human beings and not essentially people that, that are less than animals to them, we want to make sure that people get treated with, uh, with respect even though they're incarcerated. And the only way to do this is if you have this level of transparency for an organization that's been around, uh, nonpartisan, and has done an excellent job in, in, in terms of reporting what happens in our facilities. I've seen their reports, I've met with their leadership, and uh, generally speaking, they're right about 100% of the time. But I want them to be even more right, because this way, with this uh, law, they get more access immediately to any facilities they want to visit. You know, as Corrections Chair, I'm wondering how you thought about the state's handling of COVID-19 in the state's prisons. As of this week, we had uh, 17 deaths in state prisons since the start of the pandemic, confirmed deaths at least, the toll may be higher, we just don't know. Some people will say, well, that is a low amount relative to the rest of the population. Others will say that even 17 deaths could have been prevented. What did you think of the response? The transparency information gathering has always been very difficult with docs. It was no different with this issue of the coronavirus. Um, I think ultimately we will find out as we gather more information whether their response was, was correct, uh, whether the facilities acted appropriately. It's right now hard for me to measure exactly how transparent and how well of a job they did in combating the spread of the disease. I'm, I'm one of those who believe that 17 to 17 is many. However, um, under the circumstances, you know, you give a little leeway to the people that are running it, but ultimately we will determine whether or not the response was correct. I can tell you right from my experience that getting information from them is frustrating. So in that level, they didn't, I don't think they were successful. Um, they still function, um, you know, it's very secretive, correction. Docs is very secretive. Um, it's another reason why I'm gonna, uh, I'm planning on holding hearings on COVID and, and our facilities in the immediate future. Uh, I know we had one on the nursing homes, um, Yesterday, I'm going to have a further one, but I also want to focus on the work that they did in our facilities and have hearings for that. The, focusing on the state prisons and the, the county jails or more all of a facilities. broader sense? All, all, all encompassing. Um, you know, sometimes the worst actors are the local jails, uh, the sheriff's departments. Sometimes they are the worst in terms of, uh, they're certainly the worst in terms of giving information, 
Uh, but a lot of the uh, the mistreatment of, of people that are incarcerated comes from uh, facilities that are run by sheriffs. So we're going to be all encompassing and looking at everything. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on it. Senator Luis Sepulveda from the Bronx, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Stay safe. It's windy out there. Another part of the pandemic that's been overlooked is the effect it's had for undocumented people. And that community is also under new scrutiny from the federal government. President Trump now wants to take undocumented people out of the equation that determines how many seats each state gets in Congress. Not everyone agrees with that idea. I spoke with Eddie Tavares, the New York Immigration Director at Forward.us. Eddie, thanks for being here this week. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. So I wanted to talk to you because you're with Forward.us, a group that uh, represents a lot of uh, different priorities, but you focus specifically on pro-immigration policies. And I think that something that has been lost in this whole conversation around COVID-19 is how undocumented people have experienced this. And I know a lot of people that have gone to testing sites and obviously been contacted by contact tracers to get their information. But when you're living as an undocumented person, I have to assume that that is just a totally different experience. Can you tell me what you've been hearing from the community? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, great question. Um, one of the things we've been hearing from the community from you know the beginning of this pandemic is that information wasn't getting to them. Um, uh, accurate information wasn't getting to them, and also the translated version of information wasn't getting to them. So that was one of the big and continues to be quite a hurdle in the um, our communities, and particularly undocumented community um, and communities that don't speak English. Um, so that was one of the hurdles. The other hurdle is like understanding where this uh, the political climate and where the Trump administration anti-immigrant sentiment stands uh, folks were afraid to seek uh, medical help um, and also whether that's in the hospitals um, or getting tested because they were asking for a form of IDs um, and it wasn't necessarily very clear as to uh, what what they would do with that information who holds it and whether that was some type of federal uh, you know uh, efforts uh, to that's keep what it. I, I don't I mean I don't mean to interrupt you but that's what I was wondering is was the undocumented population maybe have a trend towards not seeking care and maybe not seeking testing? And that could have had a domino effect, I guess, into spreading the disease in those communities in ways that didn't happen in other communities. Yeah, it, and, and that's part of the sort of uh, issues that we've been having, right? You have an administration that has been anti-immigrant since, uh, you know, uh, Trump first ran for our office in 2015. And so that has continued on with the deportation pipeline, with the family separation. And so that's added the anxiety um, in our communities in seeking help. And, and we've seen sort of the numbers, um, including in undocumented immigrant communities, because they are at the front line of this pandemic, um, fighting it. Um, and also contributing to the economy um, in agriculture, but also uh, not retail, um, in groceries and deliveries, et cetera. So we've seen this uh, sort of uh, effort to undermine this health crisis by the Trump administration. And these are the, these communities and these individuals should be one of the first people to get tested and have that readily available, given that they are at the front line. You know, speaking of the administration, obviously they wanted to, we're right in the middle of the census count. It's going on for at least another few months, but uh, I think it was two years ago that the Trump administration said that they wanted to ask about citizenship on the census. And then um, earlier in 2019, the Supreme Court struck down that decision. And at the time I was covering that case because I was a reporter in a different outlet. And there was this theory at the time that even though the question was struck down, that it would still have an effect on the census. In other words, that undocumented people would still uh, be hesitant to fill out the census and therefore New York may have an undercount. Are we seeing that happen a year later after the Supreme Court struck that down? Yeah, you've seen the effects of the fear and making sure that people are pushed back into the shadows. And then in the midst of that, you throw the pandemic um, and the continuous rhetoric that is coming from our national and federal government. Um, and that does create a particular challenge to reach these uh, individuals that need to be counted. Um, so we've seen that throughout New York City, but also throughout New York as a whole. Now, there's also a new directive from the president that's kind of bouncing off of that Supreme Court decision that he wants undocumented people not to be counted for reasons of apportioning seats in Congress. In other words, he just wants the documented population to be counted towards uh, divvying up the seats that each state has in the U.S. House of Representatives. 
Tell me why you're against that. I could see the devil's advocate uh, point of view that people would say, well, shouldn't people that are here and legally citizens, shouldn't they be the determinative factor of the number of representative seats? Tell me your position. Yeah, I want to be clear about, you know, the the framers of the 14th Amendment were very clear on this, right? Everyone within the state uh, boundaries should be, and needs to be counted. Um, and this is not just in for the uh, sort of availability of uh, congressional seats. This is also has t ties to federal funding, right? In, in the midst of this economic crisis, these numbers determine what these localities get in federal funding for the next 10 years. So this is not just affecting uh, areas um, in, this, in blue states or blue areas, um, but this is also affecting rural areas that would depend on an accurate census count in order to be allotted federal aid. All right, Eddie Taveras from Forward.us, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be watching the state's census count over the next few months. As of this week, more than a third of the state still hadn't filled out the census. Don't forget to check out our website for daily coverage on New York politics and government. That's at nynow.org. And follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook at nynow underscore PBS. But we'll have to leave it there for this week. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well.